Hello, this is Mr. Wagnon, and welcome to Biology Essentials video number one on the effects of cone snail conotoxins. There are over 800 different species of cone snails, but we are going to focus on the conus textile in particular. The conus textile is a carnivorous snail that lives in the Indo-Pacific region, Australia, and the Indian Ocean. They're the most toxic type of cone snail, and they use harpoon-like teeth to repeatedly jab their prey to inject venom. The snail then engulfs their paralyzed prey completely and digests it. Here's a picture of a cone snail eating a fish. Here's the siphon right here. The mouth and the eye of the cone snail. You can't really see it that well, but it's not that important because cone snails uh, go mainly off of uh, their sense of smell. Cone snails as a whole uh, have around 80,000 different conotoxins. Uh, we're going to focus particularly uh, on a conotoxin called TX7, which arose from genetic mutations in the cone snail's DNA, and it allowed for a unique structure. Uh, conotoxins are a peptide. Um, they're a short sequence of peptides. So uh, genetic mutations can play a, a big role in a uh, unique structure that allows them to um, attack uh, channels within um, fish membranes or whatever that they decide to attack. Um, conotoxins have started being used for drug research and molecular targeting. And now we're going to move on to um, a neuron. We have this side over here, which is the inside of the neuron. And then over here we have the muscle, which we call a neuromuscular junction. Um, the particular channel that TX7 affects is um, the L-type VSCC, which is right here. VSCC stands for Voltage Sensitive Calcium Channel. Um, whenever we have an action potential moving down the neuron, uh, the depolarization during that action potential causes um, calcium ions to flow in to the neuron. As they're rushing in, that positive change in, um, inside of the neuron causes a neuromodulator, which is a signaling molecule, diffused to the membrane and be released. It comes around and binds. This is a type of autocrine signaling. This signals uh, a G protein right here to move along the membrane to N-type or PQ-type VSCCs, which again are voltage-sensitive calcium channels. Uh, this causes even more calcium to rush into the neuron and then that positive change within the neuron causes acetylcholine to fuse to the membrane and release into the neuromuscular junction and then that continues the action potential continues down the muscle membrane until it gets to the T-tubule which uh, causes a muscle contraction This is uh, TX7, the uh, particular conotoxin that we are focusing on. Um, as you can tell, there is a four loop structure that it has. This is characteristic of most conotoxins. But what makes TX7 unique is that um, it has six cysteine amino acids. Here's the abbreviation for that. Uh, cysteine is the only amino acid that contains sulfur. So since there's six of these, it allows for three disulfide bonds to form. And those are seen right here, right here, and right here. Um, TX7 has mostly negative charges, but it has a large hydrophobic patch, which means that um, it is uh, repelled by water. Um, the mutations in the conus textile DNA have allowed for amino acid substitutions 
that increase the toxin's versatility, uh, which allows it to attack many different types of channels um, in many different ways. Uh, it just depends on how um, one of these loops is oriented whenever um, it binds to the channel. Um, lysine, another amino acid uh, within the peptide structure of TX7, uh, gives a small positive charge residue, which increases the dynamic of TX7 even more, uh, providing uh, more routes and ways that it could attack uh, different channels throughout uh, the bodies of the cone snail prey. Um, uh, TX7 uh, is missing a, an amino acid called tyrosine. Tyrosine is a polar amino acid, which is usually within other conotoxins, but TX7 doesn't have it. So that is what causes the hydrophobic region on TX7. Um, it is replaced by phenylethylene and tryptophan, which uh, is that hydrophobic region uh, right here. And that sticks out a lot. Um, so whenever that hydrophobic region binds with um, the uh, L-type voltage sensitive calcium channels that were shown earlier, um, it's really hard for uh, the cell to dissolve that because it's uh, lipid soluble. And um, most usually other uh, conotoxins can be dissolved within, tw within 12 hours, but TX7 uh, is most likely permanent. Uh, TX7 has evolved to selectively inhibit calcium channels in their prey, which means that um, TX7 only affects uh, other species. It doesn't affect conus textile, its own species. Um, TX7 also affects RPED1 neurons, which is a different type of neuron that we haven't talked about. Um, it's a type of inner neuron in the central nervous system that um, is used for integration uh, of sensory information. So TX7 can affect those and disrupt uh, any integration of sensory information. And um, they're still doing research on that, so we can research that part of it. All right, so this is the correct mechanism. All right, this is a neuron, and this is a muscle over here. What happens first is there's going to be an action potential that comes down. That's going to happen due to depolarization, and that's going to cause what's it called the L-type VSCCs, which stand for long-term long uh, voltage-sensitive calcium channels. To open... And whenever that opens, calcium is going to flood in and cause the neuromodulators to fuse with the plasma membrane. They're going to fuse with this plasma membrane and get released into the synapse. So that's going to happen here. Then that's going to go inside of the receptor, which is a G protein receptor. That's going to cause a G protein to come over here and open an N or a PI. Q VSCC, which again stands for voltage sensitive calcium channel, that's going to cause more calcium to flood in, and that's going to trigger what's it called these vesicles, which have acetylcholine or neurotransmitter, neurotransmitters, uh, acetylcholine in this case, to fuse with the plasma membrane and then dump out the acetylcholine into the synapse. Then these acetylcholines will go to the ligand gated ion channels and open them up. That's going to allow for sodium to come from the synapse to go inside, and that's going to lead to depolarization inside of the muscle cell. That's going to trigger an action potential that just goes down to the T-tubules and causes it to contract. These sodiums technically are excitatory, and they'll cause an action potential, and that's how it works when it's correct. Next, I'll model the incorrect mechanism. Okay, so the first conotoxin that we're going to talk about is the omega one, which is the one with the cysteine bonds that blocks the voltage-sensitive calcium channel. It's going to fit right here. It's going to look like this. It's kind of hydrophobic part and a hydrophilic part. So it's going to block it, prevent calcium from entering. So since calcium can't go in, it's going to be blocked. 
they can't trigger the release of the neuromodulator and this mo neuromodulator can't go outside and start the G protein receptor without that that's not going to open this calcium channel and these neurotransmitters with the acetylcholine can't fuse so there's going to be no action potential it's going to stop there and that's the first one that uh, Colin talked about earlier uh, another type of uh, conotoxin are the psi and alpha ones which kind of look like this they block the ion gated channels right here and prevent what's it called even if acetylcholine got into the synapse they prevent the acetylcholine from binding to the ion or the ligand gated sodium channels so the sodium wouldn't be able to come in and there would be no action potential and the last type of conotoxin that there is oh, I need to label these this is psi and this is alpha and this one was the omega the last one that there is is the mu which kind of fits over here and these are just uh, voltage gated ion channels so whenever there's like a depolarization these would open normally however if the mu conotoxins were present uh, no sodium would be able to come in and no action potential would be caused so whenever the conotoxins are present the acetylcholine can't come over here and there's no action potential so there can't be muscle contraction which leads to paralysis Here's a scholarly picture of a cone snail eating a fish while I talk about the current direction of research. <laughs> okay, so toxins such as OMIA, which is an alpha conotoxin, which are the ones that bind to the ion gated channels, are being studied as they could lead to treatments for brain disorders such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. Uh, they may be useful because they can unlock certain nicotinic acetylcholine receptors that are found in the brain. These are found in neuromuscular junctions and play essential roles in con controlling the release of certain neurotransmitters. So once it wasn't identified, uh, the OMIA, uh, its chemical structure was determined and it was synthesized. By studying the conotoxin, scientists are trying to imitate it in medicine to control neurotransmitter release. And this leads to helping brain disorders such as depression, nicotine and alcohol addiction, and possibly schizophrenia. Okay, so that's the current direction of research. We're just using the conotoxins to try to mimic them in our pharmaceutical drugs. And to finish it off, here's a video of a cone snail eating a fish. Oh yeah. All right, so the cone snail's right there. You can see it's um, siphon, and it's looking for the fish. The fish is right there, and it's, um, yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, it hit the fish, now the fish is kind of paralyzed, there's conotoxins flowing throughout its body, and <laughs> it's gonna get swallowed up by its mouth. <laughs> yep, it's nature. <laughs> um, here's where we're excited and um, we're done. I uh, hope that was helpful.